Uh, my name's Lucas. I'll, I'll be chairing this session here today and tomorrow, so you're stuck with me and my terrible jokes. Uh, bef but before we kind of make a start, I'd like to acknowledge um, the people of the lands. So I respectfully acknowledge the people of the Yugambe language region, the traditional owners of the land on which we meet and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and those emerging. I would particularly like to acknowledge my wife and her family who are descendants of this land and thank them for all they have taught me about their culture and extend my respect to any First Nations people here today. So I've done something a little bit different in terms of introductions and, and whatnot this time, but before I invite Brian Hay, who's gonna be talking of around cyber criminals and serial killers and their similarities may astound you. Um, I've asked my good friend Chat GPT to write a bio for Brian Hay. So Brian Hay has an uncanny ability to communicate with squirrels. He can hold full conversations with them, exchanging secrets, jokes, and even negotiating nut sharing agreements. His squirrel friends often seek his advice on acorn storage strategies and, cons and consider him their honorary acorn ambassador. So can we give a warm round of applause and welcome Mr. Brian Hay uh, and his fantastic ability to talk to squirrels. <laughs> response to that is nuts to you but and that, yeah and we thought we could trust chat GPT and uh, artificial intelligence and that comes along but it's all in good fun good humor so folks many people are saying what the hell are you going to be talking about today Brian how do you correlate cyber criminals to serial killers well hopefully we'll find out but it, it's a uh, is it a stretch I don't think so not as much as we think because at the core of both is is people it's all about humans it's all about behaviours, understanding ourselves, understanding each other. And so we tend to categorise things and think that's the myopic view of the world that we have because they don't coalesce or they don't connect. Well, we're wrong, they do. And it's gonna, I suggest, in the future, we will see them absolutely one and the same. So it's gonna be an interesting journey. So bear with me. Um, the, uh, you know, I mean, I'm not sure if it's a fortunate position, but after being in law enforcement for nearly four decades, I had the opportunity to investigate murderers and the opportunity to investigate cyber criminals. One's a lot easier than the other. Murderers are much easier than cyber criminals. What a starting point. And if you want to know more on why that's the reason, you can buy me a beer later on tonight to go to dinner and uh, I'll share some insights to that. Okay. And the click is not working because I'm using the wrong bloody one. Here we go. Similarities may astound you, and they will. They astounded me, and I thought I had an idea before I sort of, sort of stepped upon this journey with this uh, subject. But I'd like to point out, just so everyone's aware, there will be images of people who are deceased, but there are no graphic images, okay? So what is a serial killer? If we wanted to find it, it's actually where homicides occur separated by time. Okay, it's not a mass murder situation where they just go on a, or a killing spree. There is a distinct separation of time. Sometimes that time interval can be days, weeks, months, even years. <clears throat> Jack the Ripper was the first probably notorious serial killer that we were ever introduced to in terms of a serial killer. And I'll touch a little bit more on Jack later on. One of the things I want to delve into are the, I've just lost my screen, are the personal traits that we may see in both serial killers and cyber criminals. And what's bizarre is when you dig into it, you beg the question, are they really too different? One of the things they possess is narcissism, a personality trait characterised by a grandiose sense of self-importance, a need of admiration, and attention, lacking empathy with others, for others. They believe they are superior, and wiping the scum from the centre of the earth is just part of their duty. And the classic one that comes to mind, have a look at this quote from Peter Sutcliffe, who was the Yorkshire Ripper. When he was caught, he said, the women I killed were filth bastard prostitutes who were littering the streets. I was just cleaning the place up a bit. What a bizarre comment. 
higher sense of power and being. So tick, because I'm going to share with you shortly a comment from a cyber criminal. And you know what? In a way, it's not that much difference. Lack of empathy. Serial killers have a lack of empathy. Cyber criminals have a lack of empathy. How do you think people could possibly have empathy when they sit in call centres predating upon the elderly and the vulnerable to rip them off for millions of dollars every single minute of every single hour of every day? Serial killers, no empathy. Cyber criminals, no empathy. Psychopathy, a personality disorder characterised by a lack of remorse or guilt, tick, tick. Shallow emotions, tick, tick and a tendency to manipulate and exploit others. Many serial killers, and I suggest cyber criminals, if you got the chance, would be characterised as having the personality trait of psychopathy or sociopath. Tick. Sadism. People who enjoy inflicting pain upon each other, or others, I should say. Serial killers, I'll show you many examples where they enjoy tormenting, inflicting pain upon others. And you think, what about Cyber criminals. Here was an interview, many of you may have seen it in the, uh, the interview of Four Corners, ABC Four Corners, did an interview with a ransomware gang member. Question, how do you feel when you hack into a system? Great, it's a feeling of being on top of the world, no one can touch you. So it's a feeling of power, control, elitism. Then he goes further, I love seeing them suffer. Now we're into the sadism. Okay, again, power, control, controlling other people, how they feel and not caring about it. The Medibank hack caused distress to millions of Australians. Does this concern you? Response, I could not care less. Complete lack of empathy. So what are the differences so far between serial killer behaviours, things, thoughts, characteristics and cyber criminals? I haven't found any yet. They often have a degree of social isolation. but. From a serial killer perspective, and I'll go into it a little bit further, that's is more in what we call the disorganised serial killer as opposed to the organised serial killer. They tend to be more socially isolated, not social communicators. Completely different to, say, the smarter ones, the Ted Bundys of the world, who were very charismatic and had great um, magnetism for people. People enjoyed their company. It was quite extraordinary. But how many serial killers do you know, or people that, sorry, serial killers do you know, you probably don't know anyone, and if you do, don't go to their birthday parties or anything, for God's sake. But how many cyber criminals that operate in isolation? Yes, that's part of their operandi because they don't want people to know what they do because they operate under a cloak of secrecy and they deal, of course, with other criminals around the world constantly, but in terms of their physicality, Many are in, in spheres of isolation. Tick. But what about motivation and behaviour? Okay. It's important to note that serial killers and cyber criminals are vastly different in terms of their motivations and actions, but they have commonalities in their behaviour which we should consider, especially from a behavioural science perspective. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about behavioural science. And when we go into the behavioural science, there's a great book called The Anatomy, or Anatomy of Motive by John Douglas. He wrote the first real, if you like, book on serial killers called um, Mind Hunter many, many years ago, about the mid-80s. In essence, if you look at the serial killer, he says that there's a desire for power and control. There's innate feelings of anger. There's a need for attention and recognition. Strong urge for sexual gratification because sex is associated with a lot of serial killer activities. And there's a compulsion to kill. And if we look at the motives for a lot of serial killers, serial killers, for a lot of cyber criminals, is, I would suggest very strongly, the main one is financial gain. It's all about them and their lifestyle. Sometimes hacktivist, political or social activism. Personal gain is a big one for whatever it is they want, products, services, pay no money. Revenge is one thing that I think is going to rear its head a bit more. Broken relationships, um, AI application, deep fake videos, making their past former partners be humiliated. And of course, nation sponsored uh, events with espionage. Another aspect is risk taking behaviour. There is risk associated with all crime, okay? But it's what you want to do and how do you manage that risk and how much risk do you expect? you know, do you expect? 
to actually be confronted with. Jack the Ripper was a classic risk taker. Very much what would fall in, may have started out as an organised serial killer, certainly transmitted later on into a disorganised killer in a very short period of time. But he was notorious back in 1888 and he chose his target selections of appealing to be at random on the street and to think about it, you're on the street, you start killing people, that's high risk. Vladimir Levin, when he attacked Citibank, why would you take on one of the largest banking organisations in the world and expect to get away with it? Okay, it's a high risk strategy. High target, high risk. Tick. Serial killers like to keep trophies. I'm not sure if you're aware of this or not, but you know, they'd like to keep trophies. Mementos that remind them of what they experience so they can relive it by looking or holding that trophy. Jerome, the shoe fetish slayer, had a shoe fetish. He took his victim and collected his victim's feet. Charles, the eyeball killer, Albright, kept their eyes. Joseph D'Angelo collected jewellery, cufflinks, heart pendants. Interesting with D'Angelo, I'm not sure if you have heard of him, but he was actually identified by a genealogy site. He was a former police officer, uh, committed about 15 murders, 50 rapes, and hundreds of break and enters. But it was only the expiration of time that, and certain circumstances, allowed him to be caught. And the fact that he was a police officer is interesting, and it'll come up again. What's a cyber criminal's trophy? Data. It's data. They understand the data. How many cyber criminals actually delete their data? They don't. It's a power thing. They can look back, hey, I've got Optus data, I've got Latitude data, I've got LinkedIn data. It's actually a status. Tech. Now, I've talked a little bit about organised and disorganised cyber criminal, um, organised, disorganised serial killers. And it's important to just very, very quickly understand the difference, okay? Cyber, sorry, organised serial killers plan meticulously. They tend to be highly intelligent. They personalise with the victims because they're charming and charismatic. They, uh, they control the crime scene very well. They um, tend to overwhelm their, uh, their target, their victim. They tend to transport either the body or the person, so they often would get them into a van and take them to another location. They're very conscientious, conscientious about their forensic evidence they're leaving behind. And they think about what they do. Sometimes the planning goes on for months, even years. Some can be extraordinarily patient, where a disorganised uh, criminal is one that will, it's more of a blitz attack. It's opportunistic, they have a massive compulsion, they tend to attack locally, it tends to be quite often someone they're familiar with, and that's why they tend to get caught more often. They don't worry about too much about the evidence, it's just like a, a, a sudden urge comes over them and they act the way they do. But sometimes, as I said, the organised ones have an extraordinary high IQ. Bundy had an high IQ, um, Ed Kemper had a high IQ, and of course Richard Alcala, Alcala had a very high IQ. They were estimated about 170. And extraordinary, in the middle, middle of his crime spree, suspected of an unbelievable amount, 130 women suspected of murdering, he was running on a game show situation and he was uh, the dating game killer, they called him because he appeared um, in the middle of a, uh, a TV show uh, and he was number one bachelor. So if we think bachelor is a new concept in the last 10 years, no, it was, it was going much earlier than that. But how could a person be such a monster on one side and be, appear so attractive and normal on the other? It's quite extraordinary. Tick, because have you ever met a stupid, I've met stupid cyber criminals, but I've never met unintelligent cyber criminals. And one of the things they all do is they look at strategy, ex uh, planning and execution, and understanding what success looks like. It's fundamental to everything we do every day. But serial killers really put in the work, some of them, you know, the organised ones, high IQ. You look at Israel Keyes. So he was so organised, he would actually, he knew that the best way of getting away with killing people was to travel away from his home. 
So he would sometimes travel thousands of miles. He didn't want to draw suspicion if they get pulled over in a car and he's got a kill kit with him because many, nearly all the organised serial killers carry kill kits. If he got caught with a kill kit, it could be a little bit hard to explain. So he would actually, to reduce the risk, he travelled around the country thousands of miles and he would bury caches of kill kits. So when he went to that location in the future, he knew where his kill kit was and he could execute. He would sometimes spend months getting to know, and stalk and understand his victims. Very bizarrely, he, I think they convicted him with, for two murders. He admitted to more, and I think it wasn't until after his execution or his death that they found in his room under his mattress, there's an image there of um, 12 sheets of paper, and they figured he was basically saying he had killed 11 people. And uh, the writing in ink that he was using was his own blood, so a very bizarre individual. Duh. Ivan Malat always travelled with a kill kit. He was preparing to pick up hitchhikers on the road to Belangelo and he had his kill kit with him. He was prepared. Gary Ridgway, Green River Killer, operated for over 16 years in total. And really, it, it, I'm glad we don't have polygraphs. Everyone thinks the polygraph is the great answer to ascertaining someone's guilt or innocence. Psychopaths, sociopaths, they can defeat polygraphs because they don't care about anyone else. If you're asked a question, did you kill someone, did you behead them, did you cannibalise their remains, most people are going to freak out. Not these people. It doesn't raise a heartbeat. If anything, it might ex it'll excite them. So he passed it. In the first 12 months, he was designated as a suspect for, an, for the early murders. But because he passed it, he was then dismissed. Now he's passed the polygraph. He's cool. But he got so sophisticated, after a kill, he would then go back and move the body in case it was discovered because he realised, guess what? In the US, you can have two counties side by side, two sheriff departments, but they don't talk to each other. They don't share intelligence. It's all about them. It's all about geographical focus rather than the problem at hand. It's, and people like Ridgway, another one was Bundy, took great efforts to commit crimes in different locations. So he would move the bodies of people into these locations to avoid detection. As the world started to wake up about DNA evidence and where evidence could be found on a deceased person, he realised if he was scratched, um, there could be DNA under the fingernails, so he started clipping the nails of the victims. He didn't smoke, but to confuse the investigation, he actually went and took other people's cigarette butts to the crime scene and dropped them there to throw off investigators. As a consequence of that one decision, not to pursue him as a suspect because he passed the polygraph, he continued to murder for the next 16 years and in total killed 49 women. He killed more than that, but that's all they could prove, he admitted to. But even what seems random for an organised killer has a purpose. Ed Kemper picked up young women. He murdered his mother, picked up young women on the street, and he would go out with a plan, the first good-looking girl I see tonight is going to die. I'm quite proud of the fact. Another interesting fact about M uh, Kemper was we see organised serial killers try to involve themselves in the investigations. They want to know what's going on. Kemper his, was a buddy of the local police. In fact, they, he had to convince them that he was the killer for, the, for who, he, he, who he attacked because he used to go drinking with them and they thought he was just a big, gentle giant. Six foot, nine inches tall. Sorry, I'm old. I still work in, in uh, feet and inches. And um, about 130 kilos, a huge man. Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer fits into that classic organised serial killer that then moves to disorganised. And what tends to happen when that, that occurs is they start out planned and very structured, and there might be more gaps between the length of time between the first attacks and the ensuing ones. And then they get closer and closer together, and they, it goes from a highly planned attack to a blitz attack that's more opportunistic, and that was Dharma. Very, very bizarre. 17 victims, and again, I don't want to be bagging the coppers here, 
but they hand one of the victims back after he escaped. He drilled a hole in his head, put some bleach into his brain, and was trying to turn him into a human living zombie that would have, you know, accept him. And then the police officers, after they were brought to their attention, they didn't know about the drilling in the brain, but, but actually handed him back to Dharma to look after it. It was quite extraordinary. But we look at cyber criminals, same process. They select the target. Sometimes they select a target en masse. We know from fishing, we've gone to spear fishing, we've gone to whaling, we're very precise. And we're going to see, I suggest, far more targeted attacks because if you look at the most recent three massive breaches we've had in this country, they can personalise it more than ever before. Okay, the data they have, current information on identities, there's no doubt in my mind we can see a lot more targeted spear phishing attacks in the next six, six months, 12 months. They pick their methodology, how they're going to compromise or attack that person, and then they execute. Maxim Yukobets, okay, Russian hacker, he was the, um, uh, the head of Evil Corp for 10 years, now seems to be untouchable in Russia and has made his fortunes. So, tip. You know, what cyber criminals are brilliant at is social engineering, but of course so are serial killers, the intelligent ones. And a great example of social engineering, how they take advantage of what information they have, was a woman called Shirley, Shirley Loragi. Um, she was in Rockhampton and she targeted a, uh, an American gentleman. During the conversations in the early days of their relationship, she established that he had a younger brother who'd lost his life to a, a heart condition. Loragi then informs him that she has a son that suffered the same heart condition. This gentleman would do anything to save that young boy's life, so he said, how much you know, do you need to get this surgery done? And she said, I can't afford it. Long story short, he sent hundreds of thousands of dollars to Loragi in, in Rockhampton. She sent him this photo saying, thank you, you're gonna save my son's life. Uh, this is a photograph of him um, about to have the surgical procedure to remedy this heart condition. Um, we got involved, we identified that it was taken from a website you know, for a young boy having the surgery procedure in Israel. But of course, she identified the vulnerability, she exploited it for her own financial gain at the end. So, another tick. Ed Kemper, the coppers couldn't figure out how on the earth a huge man like you, ugly as sin, get young girls into the car with you. So his ploy was to make it appear that he didn't have much time on his hands. So he was doing them a favour, but you know, I'm not gonna have time to do any harm. He'd look at his watch and say, you know, well, do I, I'm not sure I've got time for this. Of course, they fell for the trap and the ruse. When we look at um, Biono and the Hillside Stranger, and he, he did it in partnership with his cousin, uh, Bianchi, they often pretended to be law enforcement officers. Why? Because you see a uniform, it's associated with trust, authority, control, and that's how they got uh, a lot of their victims uh, into, the, into the van and they murdered and they tortured. What's really interesting is after the 10th murder, Bianchi even tried to become a police officer. And actually when you look in the background of these people, a lot of them have applied to be law enforcement or ex-military. Again, power and control. But representing trust and authority was a key element of their process to attack and execute. Is that any different today when we see business email compromise? What do they do? They establish trust, authority and power to control by impersonating the CFO, the CEO, directing that money be paid into this account, um, invoices, bank account details be changed. It's exactly the same. Tick. Of course, phishing is probably the biggest social engineering exercise that we see, and it's not going away anytime soon, of course. So both serial killers and cyber criminals are very good at pattern recognition. They are looking for certain patterns to indicate vulnerabilities in target, and it affects target selection. So they seek out those vulnerabilities, weaknesses in their target, and look at ways to exploit it. They both do the same thing. Ted Bundy, when you look at how many people, and we, we know, know for certain how many women Ted Bundy murdered, but it was far more, they estimate, than the uh, 60 they had him tagged for. And he, uh, he was Mr. Charisma. Loved to be the center of attention, very ingracious with the media, 
Uh, he befriended people easily, you know. They said he was the good looking, the best looking serial killer out there. I don't know about that. I don't, I don't know if anyone looks really good, but have a look at his victim profile. He had a pension for selecting targets, women, that were between the ages of 18 and 28, attractive, long dark hair, hair parted in the middle. Just think, ask yourself, I'll ask you this question, if you fit that profile and you knew an entity like Bundy was in your area, would you change your appearance to avoid being a potential victim? I've asked that question to a dozen people prior to coming in here this morning and everyone has said, yes, I would. So does that mean the more information we can give out the, if, from a victim profile position or a target profile position, we can actually prevent crime from occurring? When you look at John Wayne Gacy, he tricked the community because he was the funny clown that attended all these parties and community events. And when he could get, he selected his victim and invited him back to home, he would show him a handcuff trick. And he would turn around, put the handcuffs on him, turn around, and then turn back around and the handcuffs were off. And they'd say, how did you do that? And he said, I'll show you, I'll put the handcuffs on. Of course, once he got the handcuffs on, that was game over. He now had complete control. And he, he says that when he spoke to them, before he killed them, he said, uh, the real trick is, if you, is that you've got to have the key. And we see collaboration with serial killers. Catherine and uh, David Burney in Western Australia, they uh, killed and tortured four victims before they were apprehended. And it's not that, it's not common to see collaboration with a male and female, but it actually has occurred more times than, than we think. Um, so we look at cyber criminals. We remember we got a guy up in Harvey Bay. who was a young 17. I'm not going to mention his name because hopefully he's learned the error of his ways. And he hacked into a big um, gaming company that we got alerted through the FBI. And we, did, we worked with the FBI in this job. And long story short, we, we took this young fellow down. Um, he, there were some Asperger's syndrome challenges with him, but he was extraordinarily talented with a computer. And there are other parts of his lifestyle I won't go into, but it was, that side was also dis very disturbing. Um, what people don't understand, that he was actually working in concert with a Russian hacker, and they were collaborating how to do that. And basically, this young man became that entity's puppet. Very skilled, hacked into Bitcoin accounts, did a lot of stuff on gaming, was doing DDoS accounts on specific uh, targets inside the gaming environment and charging money for it. It was very complex and very, very successful. Back in those days, 110,000 for Bitcoin, imagine we'd be millions now. But the ultimate collaboration today has got to be the dark web, where thousands of people can get together, collaborate on who they select, what they're going to do, how they're going to make money, who performs what role. They're going to be uh, carve up the proceeds of the profits. That's where it's happening, right? So again, tick. Detection avoidance. I've already touched on some of that with Bundy with um, Green River Killer, but you know, they play the geographical game. We still look at crime and this challenge in a geographical sense, and we are limiting our capability to be effective. I sat, stood on a stage some years back in an FBI conference, and I said, law enforcement needs to adopt a culture of a willingness to contribute to the global effort without expectation of return. If we think we can solve these problems by thinking I'm only gonna deal with the crime that occurs in Brisbane or Brooklyn, Queensland, you've got your head up your clacker. Okay, you need to think how do we actually protect the world from cyber criminal threats, which will then ultimately pay benefit for every citizen in Australia. And until we change the attitude, we're going to have troubles. So they both try to avoid detection. We've seen the situation where, of course, where death has already occurred as a consequence of a cyber attack in Germany. A woman receiving treatment in a hospital, he got hit with a ransomware attack. They couldn't continue the treatment, put her in an ambulance to get her on another hospital 55 kilometres away, and she died en route. We've got people that suffer every day with the consequences of their victimology. Jill Ambrose, beautiful lady, still lives here on the Gold Coast. She lost her husband, she had split her family, she lost her small business, she was financially independent, now she is completely dependent. Incredible, resilient lady but will carry those scars forever. A gorgeous person. 
We've seen the case where they're utilising to go after individuals, such as the psychology clinic in Finland, and after getting the data, they started going after the individual patients, saying, pay me 200 euros or I'll ruin the online reputation ever, I'll release your files and I'm going to release the audio recordings of your therapy sessions. Now these people probably shared the most intimate details of their life with these trusted entities only to have it all exposed and here's the thing, these dipshits could sell, if I'm a crook I'm going to make money three ways, exploit the data, sell the data or do both. What are they there for? They're there for profit. You know when a cyber criminal says oh I'm not going to release your data, oh bullshit, of course they will. They will profit from it either now or into the future. They don't delete because they understand the value. So, but these people could be approached by a different scumbag piece of crap every month for the rest of their lives as they seek to make profit from their misery. We're now seeing the application of AI to mimic voices, targeting the grandparents and the parents of children with the notion, give us, I'm in a bad way, can you please uh, send some money, I need help urgently the distress and pressure that they must feel. It's only going to be a matter of time where someone is going to drive from point A to point B urgently to try and rectify this situation and have a, have a fatal traffic accident. Just a matter of time. And so uh, does that make them responsible for that death? Bloody oath it does. I've seen a situation where they will get an, an, an 80 year old grandmother on the phone and coach her through the problem, send an Uber to pick her up to take her to the bank to get the money as they keep her on the phone. No empathy, complete power and control, blah, blah, blah. So are the differences that great? But power and control is probably the biggest one. Okay? So on power and control, here are some quotes for you. And this is, these are from serial killers. I already gave you the quotes from the cyber criminals. They love the power and control, the feeling of the high, no empathy, couldn't care less. You feel the last bit of breath leaving their body. You're looking into their eyes. A person in that situation is God. Ted Bundy. I should never have been convicted of anything more serious than running a cemetery without a license. John Gacy. I'm deeply hurt by you calling me a woman hater. I am not. But I am a monster. I am the son of Sam, David Berkowitz. The woman I killed, as I've read this one before, filth bastard prostitutes littering the streets. I was just cleaning the place up a bit, Peter Sutcliffe. The moment of death is enthralling and exciting. Only those who actually kill will know what I mean. When I'm released, I will feel that moment again. I am the man of the century. No one will forget me. Pedro Lopez, monster of the Andes, killed hundreds of people. They all fit the same profile from a psychological behavioural science perspective. But what are we here for? I'm just looking at my clock. Don't want to be late. Can we apply what we've learned from studying serial killers to better understand cyber criminals? And I suggest we can. Can we understand their personalities to predict their future behaviours? Understand their behaviours to predict their next targets? Understand their target profiles to prevent victims falling prey? You know, the FBI turned a study of serial killers into a science or analysis process. And offender profiling is now accepted as part of law enforcement operations. Even though a matter of Daniel Morecambe, when we had Cowan in our sights, we knew, we figured out he was the primary suspect now, I won't go into all this unless you buy me a beer afterwards, but we actually got a psychologist in to profile him because we wanted to go as part of the undercover operation with the big boss theory. It's not going to work on everyone, but on Cowan it worked. It's not an exact science, but it can be a tool to assist investigations to narrow the field of suspects. It can assist interrogations so we can crack the veneer of uh, the psychology of the, of the suspect. And it could also reveal the target it may uncover, uncover methodology of target selection, which is key. When we look at Charles Cullen, a former nurse, suspected of murdering over 400 patients, okay? He worked physically in the hospital environment. But what if he learned to do it remotely? It's, the ability is here in such an ever-connected world with all the medications connected in the IoT world environment within health isn't it just a matter of time before someone has those digital skills and then can become God online by determining who lives and who dies? It's inevitable. When I started researching the internet's first branded serial killer by the media, I sort of 
I don't really agree with this one, but they, he was selecting his people from chat rooms and setting up the meetings. He killed, I think, about seven people. What does the future hold? Will criminals start to use AI to select their targets? In my head, no, no doubt whatsoever. They've got huge data resources, data lakes, and they'll start to, to undertake such things. Will they select their victim methodology? I'll say yes. Will digital devices become weaponised? Yes. Are we already there? I think to, it's starting. And with AI and what we've seen, I'm going to say those words, chat GPT, um, I can see it, this happening. I've been saying for years, eventually I'll get to a point where they use AI, they'll throw the algorithms across the um, data set. Someone owes me a beer. I'm not sure who it is, but you owe me beer. And the, this will do it. And then they'll automate the attack process. It's inevitable. So does that mean, could we use then AI to select our vulnerable people and proactively train and prevent? Think of what Cambridge Analytica did around the elections in the United States. How much data out there is on the, on the Google environments, the Facebook? What if we could turn that to, to good instead of just marketing and revenue is, issues? What if we could use AI to identify our criminals' modus operandi, their tips, tactics, procedures, to proactively warn, advise, and prevent. There's a novel idea. We don't have to make money out of everything. And what if we could proactively anticipate digital devices, how they could be weaponized before we release them, and build in defenses? We can turn the table, or we're we simply too bloody lazy. Folks, I know that's a lot, and I have one minute left. Um, I'll stop there. So if you have any questions, I don't think we've really got too much time, but hope that gives you an insight. That's, if at the end of the day, the point is we're all people. Our victims are people, the offenders are people, and it doesn't matter what crime they commit. We are moving into an area as we evolve as communities and societies around the world that we've got to actually start to understand the digital environment is a process of osmosis and it touches everyone. We don't containerize our thinking to a technology platform play. How do we use the skills and the brilliant minds of people such as yourselves to actually make the world a better place and start pred predicting those preventative measures that can make the difference we need? Thank you very much. Thanks, Brian. We have a, a few minutes. Are there any questions around the room? I can run around with the microphone, get my steps up. Excellent. Oh, I knew you'd be asking a question. Hello, Brian. Nice to see you again, mate. Yeah, you too, buddy. <laughs> um, I, 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 you might have covered it earlier in the talk, but I wonder if you see, do you see a commensurate um, increase in the amount of tooling available to police in order to profile or you know, better assist investigations? Now, can I answer this question without you quoting me? Hang on, you haven't said yes yet. Yet? I think, at the still, at sadly, this stage, law enforcement still got its head too far up its ass to actually understand the value that it could actually do. And why I say that is we still think in terms of borders and geographies. And until we change that thinking, the other thing, as soon as you talk technology, the budget goes up. And there's not enough simulation of bringing the two together. Now, they're doing some excellent work, such as Task Force Argos and child exploitation, because it's highly emotive and people get it. We still do not have a common language in the community of what cybercrime is, OK? And until we get that, how can we expect our politicians or law enforcement leaders to truly get it? Most of them fit in the, uh, you know, the same ageing demographic as me, and maybe I'd be in that same ignorant state. But it's when we get young people like you that have grew up in this digital environment that can take that decision and you know, I can understand the difference that can be made. And that's a day I look forward to. So let's all get police commissioners that are now in their 30s instead of their 90s, and we will see a radical change of attitudes. You're not allowed to quote me on any of that. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Darren. Uh, any other questions in the room? Up the back there? Give me one tick. Thank you very much. That was really insightful, uh, a bit disturbing, but it's good to know. Um, and it made me thinking about, um, are there any ways for police department to start sharing indicators of crimes with people? This is something that the cybersecurity industry has been doing for years now, and it's been fruitful and 
providing good results. So to protect the humans and to protect our families, loved ones, how can police departments help with that? Right, that's a great question. It's not just the police departments. How do they work in, in concert with the digital community and the cybersecurity community to actually and each, each way apart? Now, I'll let you back in a secret. You go back 10 years ago, at this event, and I applaud our search for its leadership, we used to congregate the heads of every cybercrime unit in the country, every law enforcement agent, and we would have meetings with cyber leaders to do exactly that. How can we actually build resilience through collaboration going forward? Because we absolutely need to do it. Sadly, they're not here today, and it's not the fault of OzSert. Okay, it comes back to geographical focus. And until we change that, but that is part of the pathway forward of collaboration. Absolutely, great question, thank you. Thank you, any other questions in the room? Oh, one just here, and then there's one at the back. I've got back this, thanks mate. I just wanted to touch on the point um, of use of AI and uh, just from a, a data science, data analytical uh, perspective, the, it seems that there could be a um, huge amount of work done forensically in using AI to, to match disparate data sets to look at the uh, common denominators between uh, victims of crime. Is that something that um, uh, you'd, you'd see as a uh, future direction? 100%. I think um, that's the secret is in the data. The, the special source is the algorithm that will start pulling it together. It's not going to be a perfect tool, but imagine if you can actually start to predict your target profile and start looking for it in a non-invasive, and I'm not talking about a big brother world. Hey, people can opt in, opt out. If I said to you, um, would you like me to profile your kids so, and it's in this way, if they were going to an area frequented by a 10% population of pedophiles, they're going to say absolutely. Okay? There are ways we can do this sensitive to privacy and people's needs. But the first thing we've got to do is open the door to the conversation. So absolutely vital. Cool. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brian. Uh, that's all we have time for. We've got a couple of minutes to, to set up for the next speaker. If you do have any other questions, are you around? Mate, I'm around. Um, Absolutely, for the next couple of days, someone come and say good day. Thank you. And buy me a beer. Can we have a round of applause, please?